This is a picture of me when I was uh, much younger, 25 years ago, leaving university. And when I was a student, I'd been thinking about the big questions, about the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. And in particular, I'd been thinking about our human nature. When I was at university, I read the work of John Locke, who was telling me that we were a blank slate that could be written on by experience. I was reading the work of B.F. Skinner, a psychologist who had pioneered behaviorism and argued that we could be understood as a consequence of our behaviors as the responses to the stimuli in our environment. And I read the work of Adam Smith, who argued that we were often driven by rational self-interest. I heard these scholars, I read their ideas, I believed them, but I was wrong. <laughs> and years, a few years later, I went to law school, and I was reading, uh, I was supposed to be reading contracts, but instead was reading Scientific American. And I came upon the work of a guy named Marcus Reichel. He's a neuroscientist and, and researcher who is quite fascinated with whether we could use this new technique of MRI in the context of functional MRI, measuring changes, very tiny changes, in blood flow to particular brain regions, with the idea that the hungry neurons in the specific brain regions were going to need more metabolic energy to do the things that he was asking them to do in the scanner. And he'd have them do things like conjugate verbs in a foreign language or do math problems or rotate an object in their imaginations. And he had them do this while he was taking images at the very beginning when they had first learned to do the task and after they'd gotten a chance to practice it a bit. What he noticed were there were dramatic differences in the amount of blood flow going to those regions that we knew were involved in some of these tasks. This allowed us in this research be looking at novices and sophisticates, people who'd done a task and then when they practiced it again, to get some ideas about the brain regions involved in those tasks. So I went, became a lawyer, got bored of being a lawyer, and decided to go off and get a PhD in political science. And what I discovered while I was in political science classes in my very first year was that when, that when we look at people who know a lot about politics, they appear to think differently than people who don't know much about politics. This work had been going off since the beginning of the work in surveys where we could gather data of this type. And it led me to think back to this study by Marcus Reichel. And I thought, you know, maybe we could use brain imaging to look at people who knew a lot about politics and compare them with people who didn't know much about politics. My advisor thought this was uh, not going to be a productive idea, perhaps, at first go. But I, I pushed a little bit, and he encouraged me. And I suggested that we could look at people who are members of the UCLA Democrat Club, members that were mem uh, members of the UCLA Republican Club, and compare them while they were answering political and non-political questions with people who didn't know very much about politics. I was expecting at this time that there would be a lot of difference in the frontal lobes of the brain. Because the frontal lobe is involved in rational decision making and a lot of executive functions. And it's grown dramatically in our species over the last three million years. We've had this 100,000 new neurons have been added every generation um, as our, our frontal lobes and other regions of the brain have expanded and we've become much more powerful. This is what I expected, frontal lobe activation, and I was wrong. Turns out that the data was a lot more messy than that, and it wasn't going at all what I was expecting. That the, the Democrats, the Republicans' brains, actually looked really similar when they were doing these tasks. When they were thinking about politics, their brains were so similar that one of the reviewers of this paper, when it was being reviewed, thought that we'd actually copied the same image twice um, and made a mistake in the, in the way we were submitting it. This led me to believe that perhaps Republicans and Democrats think about the world in exactly the same way, using the same neural mechanisms to process the world. But again, I was wrong. And I'll tell you more about that in a, in a minute. To try and understand the data that I'd had, though, initially, I went, ended up going back to the work by Marcus Reichel. And Marcus Reichel, after doing these initial experiments, comparing people's brains when they were doing tasks, conjugating verbs, or doing math, or rotating objects in their minds, he would compare them to their brains when they were just laying in the scanner at rest. But he had that next level insight, which was, well, what's going on in the brain when you're at rest? So he subtracted out the activity that had been going on during the tasks to see what parts of the brain were most active when we were at rest. What he discovers is an area of the brain, a network of regions that he describes as the default mode network. This is a set of regions of the brain that is consuming 20% of our metabolic energy that's going to our brain. That was just an incredible amount for a part of the brain that basically shuts off 
when we try to do anything. So this was a puzzle. What is going on in this resting brain that turns off when we think about uh, the world? Well, it turns out that the activity that I had discovered in the politically sophisticated people was the same pattern of activity that had been decreasing during the uh, technical tasks. What, he discovered, what I discovered was that we saw a pattern of activation in these regions, in this default mode network, when politically knowledgeable people were thinking about politics. What this led me to understand was that for political novices, thinking about politics was essentially like taking an exam in school. It was some kind of verb conjugation, math test with object rotation. It was really difficult. But for the political sophisticates, the people who thought about national politics all the time, it increased inactivity when they were thinking about politics as if it was another type of social activity. Lots of the social activities that we studied after the initial work by Reichel had shown increases in the default mode network when, we were, when people were doing office politics or family politics or church politics. It turns out the same subjects that I'd imaged that were political novices in national politics could also use their brains just the same way when they're thinking about the politics of everyday life. This led me to believe that your brain is built for politics. The reason that we have, the very brains that we have, is to solve the problems of being a political animal. This is sometimes known as the social brain hypothesis. But I think that's a bit of a misnomer because there's lots of different ways of being social. Fish go to schools and ants have colonies and bees fly around together. But if we look at ants when they're having social interaction, you don't need to know much if you're an ant to figure out whether somebody's a friend or a foe. You just give them a quick sniff and you can tell if they've got the right pheromones. For being a political animal, however, it's much more complicated. Dolphins. Hyenas, elephants, chimpanzees, a variety of different political animals have very complex dynamic social lives that require tremendous amount of cognition to keep track of the various relationships that they have because these coalitions are constantly shifting. If you're a dolphin, you might go swimming and hunting with one dolphin today and a different dolphin tomorrow. You might be forming a little cluster of in a pod today, but a different pod tomorrow. And when I lived in San Diego every once in a while, there'd be megapods of hundreds, or even thousands of dolphins gathering together in the ocean. You can't, as a political animal, just go up and sniff somebody at your office meeting if you're trying to figure out whether they're going to work with you or work against you at the next project that you're working on. Being a human is much more difficult. Our coalitions are constantly shifting and constantly dynamic. We're together today for the first time as a group and probably will never be together again. That's the nature of being the kind of animals that we are. To understand this more, I looked at people who were gambling. I got data of their brains and their behaviors while they were engaged in gambling behaviors. What we discovered was, what, we thought, what I thought at first in this work was that perhaps we'd be able to look at the behaviors of Republicans and Democrats and tell their political ideology based on the pattern of behavior while they were gambling. But I was wrong. It turns out that when you go and you look at the data, Republicans and Democrats gambled exactly the same way. You cannot go to Las Vegas and see the differences in political party identity by looking at the way they gamble in Vegas or in, or in Monaco. Um, that just isn't going to help you at all. To be able to understand this further, I thought perhaps I could look at their brains, but seeing that the behaviors were identical, I thought, well, maybe their brains are going to be processing this task exactly the same as well. But I was wrong. Turns out we could classify people with 83% accuracy simply by looking at their brains when they were gambling. This blew my doors off. I had no way of, of expecting that we'd find such dramatic differences. For people who were Democrats, we identified an increase in a region of the brain known as the posterior insula. This is a part of the brain that is active when you've got a stomach ache or you're feeling your heartbeat. It allows interoception, the feeling of your own feelings. For people who were Republicans, what we discovered was an increase in activity in the brain in a region known as the amygdala. This is a part of the brain that's involved in processing threat and fear, but a wide range of other emotions. This was particularly astonishing to me because 83% accuracy just wasn't what we were expecting. We'd known for many years in political science that we can classify somebody as being Republican or Democrat based on their parents' political affiliation. 
We could classify you with about a 69% accuracy. I know the party affiliation of your parents. But it's much more difficult to do that uh, when we're looking at other, at other data that we have. When we know your parents, I know a lot about your socioeconomic status and your education, your geography, languages, religious beliefs, upbringing, and I even know all of your DNA because I know that you get all of your DNA from your biological parents. So we could classify people better with this gambling data from their brains than we could from knowing all that we know from their parents. This was really surprising because the model in political science has been a socialization model that encountering political parties in the political world lets us know about the choices that we're going to face and shapes our political minds and perhaps our political brains. But more recently, we've been learning about the role of biology. We've been learning that if we study monozygotic and dizygotic identical and fraternal twins and we compare their correlations, it explains about 40% of the, of the political ideology that they have. About 40% of your political ideology is attributable then to biological sources. So I thought perhaps that this data was telling us that the strong results we were getting by looking at people's brains was because it was being driven by biology. But again, I was wrong. It turns out that our results are simply too strong to be accounted for by biology alone. The results we're getting are too strong to be just DNA. In fact, the understanding that I have now is that our political mind is a consequence of those environmental influences, the socialization that we've talked about, the role of biology, but also the choices we make about who to affiliate with and where we're gonna vote, where we're gonna live, the choices that we make on a regular day. I used to believe that we were hardwired in our political attitudes. I thought that we were like a computer circuit board that was going to be permanently affixed in a particular way, but I was wrong. What I believe now instead is that we're hardwired not to be hardwired. The very challenge of being a political animal, living in a world of constantly shifting coalitions, means that we need to have the kind of flexible minds that have evolved service as political animals. We live in a time where there's a lot of political conflict, there's a lot of strife, there's a lot of disagreement among people, where we think differently than others and worry that will we ever be able to get along. But the data that I've got gives me a lot of hope for the future. We're not like ants with hardwired enemies and hardwired friends. Rather, the experimental work shows that it's really hard to get people to not cooperate. We have a tendency to want to help each other. We want to, we want to be nice to each other. It turns out that it is very easy to shift coalitions with very minimal changes in stimuli. We can get people to work together who've never worked, be worked together before. This work gives me a lot of hope that because our brains for, are built for politics and that we're hardwired not to be hardwired, old enemies can become new friends. But I've been wrong before. Thank you.